Edexcel, GCSE, Mathematics, Linear, Paper 2, Calculator, Foundation Tier, June 2010. As previously, take the opportunity at the start of the exam to write down any formula on the formula page you think you might need to remember during the course of the exam. So you may feel that you need to remember that 50 miles is 80 kilometers. Or it may be something as simple as that one litre is a thousand millilitres. Anything you think you're liable to forget during the course of the exam. On question one, I'm shown a pictogram. And in part A, I'm asked to write down the number of hours of sunshine on Wednesday. And the important thing to use is the key over here, which shows me that a full circle represents four hours. So on Wednesday I've got one circle which is worth four, another one worth four, and a third one worth four, so in total I've got twelve. In part B I'm asked to write down the number of hours of sunshine on Monday. So on Monday I've definitely got four, another four, and this half a circle is going to represent two. So in total there I've got ten. On Friday I'm told there are eight hours of sunshine and I'm asked to show this on the pictogram. So on Friday for eight hours I want a circle for four and another full circle. For another four. And finally on Sunday I'm told there's six hours of sunshine and asked to show this on the pictogram. So on Sunday I need four hours and I also need half of a circle for the additional two hours. On question two, part A I'm asked to write down two pounds and eighty pence in figures. So that's going to be two pounds decimal point and the pence afterwards. And in part B I'm asked to write down two pounds and six pence in figures. So two pounds and six pence would be zero six. Question number three in part A I'm asked to write down the mathematical name for each of these 3D shapes. So the first one is a cuboid. The second one here is a sphere, and the third one here, the easiest thing to call this, is a triangular base pyramid. In part B, I'm shown a solid prism made from centimeter cubes, and I'm asked to find the volume of the prism. Now I'm told that one centimeter cubed is the same as one box. So I'm just going to look at the front of this diagram. I've got one, two, three for five boxes at the front and that goes backwards for two layers. So I've got two lots of five and therefore in total I've got ten. So the volume of this prism is ten centimeters cubed. Question four. I'm given a two-stage number machine where the first operation is to multiply by 10 and the second one is to add 3. And I'm asked to complete the table. The first two are done for me, so I'm going to do the input of 5. So I'm going to start with an input of 5, I'm going to times that by 10 and I'm going to get 50, and then I'm going to add 3 to that and I'm going to get 53, and that would be my output of 53. So here, 53. Now in the second part here, I'm supposed to fill in the input when I'm given the output. So I need to be going from the output, 103, back to my input. So rather than doing add 3, I'm going to do the opposite of add 3, which is take away 3. And rather than doing times 10, I'm going to do divide by 10 because I'm heading in this direction. So 103 take 3 is 100. And 100 divided by 10 is 10. And therefore my input must have been 10. Now it's worth checking that that works going the other way. So imagine I'm taking the 10, multiply it by 10, I get 100. Add 3 and I get 103, which is what I started with. In question 5, I'm given 5 words, impossible, unlikely, even, likely, and certain, and I'm asked to use one of those words to best describe the probability. So in 5 part A, that the sun will shine in July next year in London, that is going to be certain. Uh, 5B, the next baby to be born will be a boy or... In 5B, that the next baby to be born will be a boy. 
well there are only two options there which is a boy or a girl and therefore roughly speaking and that's 50 50 so that would be an even chance and 5c that there will be 50 days next month now i know that the maximum number of days in a month is 31 so that therefore is going to be impossible In question 6, I'm asked to draw a circle of radius 5 centimetres and I'm told to use the point O marked with a cross as the centre. So I need to make sure that the centre of my circle is this cross, not the letter O. So what I need to do is, is take my ruler and make sure that my compass is opened out to 5 centimetres. So I'm just checking there that that's about 5 centimetres. And then I can take the point of my compass and place it on O, cross. And being reasonably accurate, I can then do myself a circle. Now I'm going to do it in two. So I'm going to do one side with one hand, and then I'm going to switch, and then I'm going to do the other side with my other hand. Now it's important that I've got a single smooth line here. It needs to be a nice smooth line, not loads of different lines going like this around the outside. Okay. In part B, I'm asked to mark on the diagram with arrows a pair of parallel lines. Now parallel lines are like train tracks, even like that. So um, I'm going to use this one here. And this one, you notice they've got the same amount of arrows, and I'm showing that it needs to be two here. Um, in B part I, I, I'm told that I need to mark with the letter R a right angle. Now a right angle is 90 degrees, and I can see that that therefore is a right angle. Now I need to make sure I put the letter R on there as I've been told to mark it with that. In question number seven, I'm asked to complete the table using either metric, which is new measures, and those would either end with meters, liters, or grams, or using old measurements, imperial measurements, and there's a variety of those. So the height of a door, I would measure that with meters. The weight of a man, any imperial measure, um, is an old-fashioned measure, so that's going to be stones. And the volume of water in a bucket is going to be in metric units. You see, they're going to be meters, liters, or grams. Well, the volume is going to be liters. In question eight, I'm asked to work out five squared. Now, five squared is the same as five times by five, which is. 25. If this had been a larger number, I could have used my calculator and the squared button, so I could have pressed 5 and then squared and pressed equals to get 25. And in part B, I'm asked to find the square root of 3.24. Now the square root of 3.24 would be written like that. So on my calculator, I'm going to press the square root key, which is just here, and then enter in 3.24. And I'm going to get 1.8. So the square root of 3.24 is 1.8, and that's my answer to part B. In question number 9, I'm given the first four terms of a number sequence. So 7, 10, 13, 16, and I'm asked to write down the next term in the sequence. Well, I can see that each time I'm adding 3. So the next term... Would be 16 added 3, so 16 and 3 is 19. So the next term is 19. And in part B, I'm asked to explain how I found my answer. And I'm going to write down that I added 3 to the previous term. Question number 10, I'm shown a rectangle and I'm asked to draw on all the lines of symmetry. Now you can see that it would fold nicely in half down the middle. And again you would use a ruler to draw these on and I can see that it would fold nicely in half going across the centre. Now very often in this question you have people drawing lines going diagonally. Now it's important to note that diagonally here this shape will not have a line of symmetry. So both of these lines would be wrong. We're just looking for the two lines in blue, that one and that one. In the second part of the question, I'm asked to write down the order of rotational symmetry of a regular pentagon. 
Now, to do that, if you're not sure, rotational symmetry means spinning it round. So I'm going to take a piece of tracing paper. I'm going to trace my regular pentagon. And I'm going to put my pen in the middle and I'm going to spin it around and see how many times it's the same. So, so I'll make sure I get back to where I started. I'm going to put a point straight up. So it looks the same once, twice, three times, four times, and five times. So it looks the same five times in 360 degrees. So the rotational symmetry is order five. And finally in part C I'm given a shape and I'm asked to write down the rotational symmetry for this shape as well. And again, I can take my piece of tracing paper, I can roughly trace that shape. And it doesn't have to be the world's greatest version of it. Place my pen in the middle roughly and spin it around and make sure in 360 degrees, how many times does it look the same? So in 360 degrees, I might have to move it about a little bit, that looks the same once. And then round again. It's twice it looks the same, and finally, and again, it's three times it looks the same. So the order of rotation symmetry is three. In question 11a, part I, I'm asked to write down the temperature shown on each of the thermometers. So in the first part, I can just about see that the scale goes from 20 to 25 and then to 30, and there are five marks there, and therefore it's going up in ones. So all I've got to do is read off in ones that this was 15, and therefore it's gone three more up, so that's 18 degrees C. Similarly in part II, it's the same thermometer, it's still got the same number of marks between 0 and 5, so it's just going up in ones, so I'm one less than negative 5, so negative 6. Uh, in part B, I'm shown a table, and asked to write down the lowest temperature from this list here. Well, I've only got two negative numbers of negative 3 and negative 1, and I know that negative 3 is less than negative 1. Now in part C, I'm asked to write down the difference in temperature between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. So 6 p.m. is here, and 10 p.m. is the one underneath it. So I need to know the difference in temperature between those two. So to work that out, I could, if I wanted, go on number line. There's negative 1, and there's 4, and work out the distance between them. So if I go up by 1, that would take me to 0, and then if I go up by another 4, that would take me to 4. So the difference there must be 4 add 1, which is... Five. In question number 12, I'm shown a shape and I'm asked what fraction of the shape is shaded. So altogether I can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six in each row, so there must be 12 pieces altogether. And I can see that there's one, two, three, four, five shaded, so that must therefore be five twelfths that's shaded. Uh, in part B, I'm given a list of fractions and told that two of them are not equivalent to one fifth. And I'm asked to write down which ones are equivalent to one fifth. So, a couple of ways of doing this, I could start with one fifth and I could write down the equivalent fraction chain. So, the first one is the one times table on the top, which would then be two, three, four, five, and so on. On the bottom, I would have the five, so five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty five. And all of these are equivalent fractions. So straight away I can see that two tenths is in there. So that one I can get rid of. Um, three fifteenths is equivalent to it. However, I've got three tenths. And that means that three tenths must not be the same because I know that two tenths is. So that definitely is one of my answers there. Uh, keeping going here, I've got four twentieths. So that definitely works. I've got five twenty-fifths. However, in my list I've got five twentieths. So five twentieths. Can't be equivalent, so that's my second answer of 5 twentieths. And it's just worth checking that 10 fiftieths is also equivalent. And to do that, I'm going to try and turn this into 10 over 50. Now I can see that to get from 5 to 10, if I just kept going, I could times that by 2. From 25 to 50, I could times that by 2, and therefore it's equivalent. In 12 part C, I'm asked to work out 3 quarters of 64. So 1 quarter of 64 will be 64 split into 4 pieces, so divided by 4, which would be 16. So in terms of a diagram, something split into quarters, this bit is worth 16. Now I'm asked to work out 3 quarters, not 1 quarter, so I could take this 1 quarter and say that 3 quarters of 64 is going to be the 1 quarter 16 multiplied by 3. Effectively I'm putting 16s 
taking all of these and saying, okay, I want three quarters, so I want that bit there. So three times by 16 is going to be 48. And again, you're allowed to use your calculator to work that out. So my answer is 48. Question 13, I'm told that tulips cost 85 pence each, and I'm told that Sarah's got 20 pounds to spend on tulips, and I need to work out the greatest possible number of tulips she can buy. So 20 pounds is going to be 20 times by 100 in terms of pence, so therefore it's going to be 2,000 pence. So I need to find out how many 85s will go into 2,000 pence, and the mathematical operation for that is 2,000 divided by 85. So how many 85s go into 2,000? So 2,000 divided by 85, and that gives me the rather long answer of 23.529411176. Now obviously you can't buy that amount of tulips, so the number of tulips you can buy is either going to be 23 or 24, and there is sometimes a little bit of confusion over this. Now the actual answer we're looking for is 23. If you can't buy 24, because if I try to do 24 times by 85, 24 times by 85, I'd see that that's over 2,000, that's 2,040. Whereas if I did 23 times by 85, you can see that that's 1,955. So she can afford the number in blue here, but can't afford the number in red, the 2,040. In part B, I'm told that she pays with a £20 note, and I'm asked to work out how much change she should get. Well, £20 notes, as before, is 2,000 pence. And I need to take away from that the amount she's spending, which I've got here, which is 1,955. And if I do that, I'm going to get that it's 45 pence. So my answer there is 45 pence. And again, you can do this on a calculator. You don't need to work it out in your head. In question 14, I'm given a two-way table about the subject studied by 50 students. So you can see the total here is 50. And I'm asked to complete the two-way table. So I know that the number of students studying law is 11, and there are six males, and therefore this number here must be 5. I know that the number of students that are females is 25, and I've got 5 studying law and 6 doing engineering, which is a total of 11. And therefore this must be 14 to take me up to 25. Similarly, 18 here in total, 14 of which are female, and therefore must have 4 males. I've also got 50 in total and 25 females, so this should be 25 males. And then finishing that off, I've got 11 and 18 here, which is 29. And I've got 50 in total, so that must be 21, and therefore that's 15. In part B, I'm told that one of the students, and that's all the students, and I know that there are 50, is chosen at random, and I need to find the probability that that student is male and studies law. So male studying law is that box there, and therefore I know the probability is going to be 6 out of the total number of students. Note that it's not always the total number of students, sometimes it's a subset, but here they wanted all of the 50, so it's 6 fiftieths. I'm not asked to cancel it down, so I'll leave it at 6 fiftieths. Question 15, I am shown a conversion graph that changes between litres here and gallons here. It's just important you make sure you know which is on which axis. And in part A, I'm asked to change uh, 50 litres to gallons. So 50 litres would be here. I need to change that into gallons. And to do that, I'm going to take my ruler and I'm going to draw a line across until I get to the graph. And then I'm going to come back. And that would hit there on the axis. Now, that's obviously not 11 gallons exactly, so I need to figure out what my scale goes up. So I can see that there are five boxes here, between 10 and 11, and I'm going to try and go up until I get to 11 stages. Now, if I went up in 0.1s, I'd only get to 10.5, so 10.1, 10.2, 10.3, 10.4, 10.5. So I need to go up in 0.2s, 10.2, 10.4, 10.6, 10.8. So that is 10.8 gallons, and it's important you get the scale right. Part B, I'm told to change 6 gallons to litres. So this time I've got 6 gallons, which is here. So I draw a line at 6 gallons until I get to the line I'm originally given. And then I draw a line across 
from there. And now I've got to read off from this scale, so I need to know what this scale goes up in. Well, fortunately, there are 10 sections between 20 and 30, so this is going up in ones. So that would be roughly 27 litres. In part C, am I told that one litre of petrol costs £1.15? So one litre costs £1.15, and I'm asked to work out the cost of 50 litres of petrol. So therefore I need to do £1.15 times by 50. And as this is calculator paper, I can work that out in my calculator as 1.15 times by 50, which equals 57.5. Now, if I write that here, I'm going to lose a mark, because I'm asked to give this as pounds, and therefore I'm going to need on the end an extra zero to make it pounds and pence, 57 pounds 50. In 15 part D, I'm asked to work out an estimate for the cost of one gallon of petrol. Now, using the graph, there's a couple of ways of doing this. I can see that one gallon is here. And therefore, if I draw a line up to the graph, it's round about there, which is probably easy to read off with a pencil, but I think that's about 4.5. So I know that one gallon is approximately 4.5 litres. Now, I know that petrol costs £1.15 a litre, and therefore if I can do 4.5 times by 1.15, I'm going to get the cost for one gallon, or 4.5 litres. So 4.5 times by 1.15, and I get 5.175. Now, as I'm told to work out an estimate, it doesn't have to be overly accurate, so I can round this, and I'm going to call that £5.18. Again, that's because it's two decimal places, which is pounds and pence, the 7 is going to make that go up by 1, 2 and 8. There are various ways of doing that question. You get a whole range of answers you're allowed, but that would be the easiest method for me. In question 16, I'm asked to solve x over 5 equals 3, and I know that x over 5 means x divided by 5 equals 3. So what I want to get rid of here is I want to get rid of this divided by 5 here. And to do that, I'm going to do the opposite, which is times by 5, so I'm going to times both sides by 5, and on this side that would leave me with just x, and on this side 3 times 5 is 15, so x equals 15. Similarly here, I'm told to solve 2y minus 4 equals 9, so I'm going to try and isolate y and get it on its own, so I'm going to get rid of this takeaway 4 by adding 4 to both sides, and I'm going to have just on this side 2y, and then 9 add 4 is 13. Okay, so this is 2 times by y, so I'm going to do the opposite of that, which is divide by 2. So 2y divided by 2 is y, that's easy enough. And 13 divided by 2, I can get away with writing 13 divided by 2 like that. In this case, the answer is 6.5, that's fine, you're allowed that. But here I would always stick to just using the fractions, 13 over 2. In question 17, I'm shown a diagram, and I'm told to work out the bearing of B from A. So I'm starting at A, and I'm trying to get to B. Now I know that bearings have to be measured round from clockwise, and therefore I need to go all the way around to there. Well, this side of the line is going to be 180 degrees, and I've also got to add on this 40 degrees in here that I'm given originally. So 180 at 40. 8 out 4 is 12, and therefore my bearing is 220 degrees. In question 18, I'm given a train timetable. There are six trains from Birmingham to London. The trains are called A through to F, and I'm asked which train takes more than two hours to go from Birmingham to London. Now, the first train, if I did two hours on tier, would be 8.35. This would be 9. This would be 9.15, this would be 9.30, this would be 9.45. So train E takes more than two hours to get to London. So if it had taken two hours, that would have been 0.9.45. It doesn't get there to 0.9.59. Now part B, I'm asked to work out the number of minutes taken by train D to go from Birmingham to London. So train D is this one here. And I need to know how long it took in minutes. So I'm using a number line. That's going to be 0730, and then I've got to go all the way up to 0904. Remember, my answer 
has to be in minutes. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add on 30 minutes to get to 0800 and then I'm going to add on 60 minutes to get to 0900 and then I need to add on finally 4 minutes to get to 904. So in total I've got 30, 60 and 4 and if I add 30, 60 and 4 up I'm going to get my answer of 94 minutes. In part C I'm told that Paula has to go to a meeting in London and she's going to catch one of the trains from Birmingham and she needs to get to London before 9 and I'm asked to write down the latest train that she can get. Now all of these trains get to London before 9 o'clock but I'm asked to write down the time of the latest train she can catch. Now remember it's the train she can catch not when she gets to London so I'm looking for 07 15. In question number 19, I must use my calculator to work out 2 over 1.5 add 2.45. So there's a couple of ways of doing this. First of all, I would do it by working out both bits of this sum separately. So I'm going to work out the bottom bit of 1.5 add 2.45. And again, I'm allowed to use my calculator, so I might as well, which is 3.95. So I'm left with 2 over 3.95. And this is the same as 2 divided by 3.95. So again on the calculator, 2 divided by 3.95 is 0.506329113. And I'm asked to write down all the figures on my display so I can just write that in there. Now the other way of doing it is to use brackets and put brackets around the top bit and the bottom bit. Now in this case the ones at the top we don't really need because there's just one single number there, but we will put them in just to show you this works always. So put brackets and then 2 divided by open brackets 1.5 add 2.45 and close the brackets, hit equals, I get the same answer as before. Okay, and in part uh, 2 I'm asked to round that to two decimal places. So the second decimal place is this zero here. I look at the number after it, the 6, which means I'm adding one on to this number here because it's past halfway, it's more than five. So I am doing 0 0.50 and I'm adding one in that column and therefore I'm going to get 0 0.51. So my answer to two decimal places is 0 0.51. In question 20 I'm shown, shown a scatter graph with the information about the number of umbrellas sold and the rainfall in centimetres. And I'm told that in January this year rainfall was 6.1 centimetres and again, I've got to make sure I read the scale properly, but 6.1 here is just going to be there, that's 6.1. And that 32 umbrellas were sold. And again, these are going up in one, and I've checked my scale, that's going to be 32 there. And I'm just asked to mark that information on the scatter. So I need a cross where those two meet, which would be there. In part B, I'm asked what type of correlation it shows. So correlation is either positive if it goes in that direction, negative if it goes in that direction or no correlation if they're all over the place. Now in this case I can see there's a pattern going upwards and therefore this is positive correlation. Finally in part C I'm told that Mr Wither sold 40 umbrellas um, in February and I'm asked to estimate the rainfall for February. So 40 umbrellas is here, so this is February. And I'm asked to estimate the rainfall. Now to do this I need to draw on my graph a line of best fit. Now roughly speaking it should go through the middle of the data too accurate, I would count the number of points and half them. Notice it's gone all the way across my graph, and I've got one, two, three, four, five, six below the graph, and one, two, three, four above it. So I may be a little bit off, but you can spend a little bit more time in your exam making sure that it's roughly through the middle. So for 40 umbrellas in February, if I draw a line across, similar to what I did on the conversion graph, you can see that I get something around about there. Now reading my scale off, it's hard to tell, it's either 7 or 7.1, so I'm going to go with 7.1 centimetres rainfall in February. In question 21, I'm told that Eddie hired a car in Italy and that it cost £620 and that £1 is worth €1.25. And I'm asked to work out the price in euros, so I know that £1 is equal to €1.25 and I need to know what 
620 pounds is. So if I did 620 lots of one pound, I'd get to 620. And so similarly, I need to do one euro 25 times by six pounds, sorry, 620. So I want 1.25 times 620, and that's going to give me my answer. So on a calculator, 1.25 times 620, which is 775 euros. In part B, I'm told that he bought some perfume in Italy, and the cost of the perfume was 50 euros, and the cost of the same perfume in London was 42 pounds. And I'm asked to work out the difference between the costs, and my answer has to be in pounds. So I could change the pounds here into euros, but then I'm going to get an amount in euros. So what I need to do is change the euros into pounds. Now I know that one pound is equal to one euro 25, and I need to have 50 euros changed back into pounds. So I've got to figure out what I'm going to go to do from here to here. And to do that, I need to do 50 divided by 1.25. Now if I do 50 divided by 1.25, I'm going to get 40. So that is 40. So I must have 40 lots of 1.25 and therefore I've got 40 lots of one pound, which is obviously 40 pounds. So I can see that the perfume costs 40 pounds in Italy and 42 pounds in London. But I'm asked to work out the difference, so I need to do 42 pounds, take 40 pounds, which is two pounds, and that's my answer. The difference of two pounds between those two perfumes. Question 22, I'm asked to complete the table of values, so y equals 3x plus 4. And I'm given a couple of values, when x is negative 1, y is 1, and when x is 2, y is 10. So I need to finish this off. So I'm going to start with the positive numbers. So when x is 1, I need to do 3 lots of 1, which is the 3x, and I need to add 4. So 3 lots of 1 would be 3, add the 4 is 7. So y must be 7. Similarly, when x is 0, I need to do 3 lots of 0. And then I need to add on 4. So 3 lots of 0 is nothing. Add on 4 is 4. Now, I now need to work out when x is negative 2. x equals negative 2. So I need to do 3 lots of negative 2. Add 4. Now, 3 lots of negative 2 is negative 6. Add 4 is negative 2. Now, I could put that one in there. Now, sometimes people struggle with the negative numbers. So if you want, you can actually just start to think, hang on, I can go backwards in 3s each time. And therefore... From 1 to there would be take away 3, so this needs to be negative 2. It's worth being able to check it both ways. Okay, in part B, I'm asked to draw the graph of y equals 3x plus 4 on the grid. So to do that, I need some coordinates. So the first coordinate I've got here is 2, 10. And x is 2, y is 10. And I can go on writing my coordinates down. 1, 7, 0, 4, negative 1, 1. And finally, negative 2, negative 2. And it's just a case of putting those on my graph now. Make sure you use the scale so it's not um, one square going across is one, it's actually two squares. So I need to go across to here for two and then up to ten. And then one seven would be here similarly, actually across two squares to get to one. And then naught four would be here. And then negative one one. And then negative two, negative two. And I get all my crosses. Now to draw the graph, I need to make sure that I also go on with a ruler, a line going through all of those points to finish the question off. So Roughly speaking, again, you can be more accurate with a pencil. Something along those lines, and that is the line y equals 3x plus 4. Obviously, if you draw this line and one of your points is over here and doesn't fit on, it's worth then going and investigating and saying, okay, this point doesn't look right. Have I got it right in the original question? Well, this is for the line where x is 0, so did I get this one right here? Question 23, I'm asked to work out the size of the angle marked x. Now, I'm showing a little square here, which means this is 90. So at the moment, I've got 130 and 90, which if I add it up, gives me 220. Now, I know that there are 360 degrees around this circle. And therefore, if I do 360, take that 220, I'm going to get what the angle x is, which is 140 degrees. And I'm asked to give a reason for my answer. And the reason for that is one of my angle facts, which is that uh, angles at a point, and in this case, that's the point there, add to 360 degrees. 
Okay, in part B, I'm showing another diagram and a couple of things marked on there. I know that these lines are parallel because of these two arrows here. And I'm told that LM N, sorry, LMD here is 68 degrees. And I'm asked to work out the angle Y. Well, I know that this angle here is also going to be 68 degrees. And the reason for that is that I've got here two parallel lines and the angles in between them. And that used to be called the Z angle. However, you need to make sure now that you use the phrase, that's an alternate angle. And we can tell it's an alternate angle because both angles are inside parallel lines. So this angle is 68, and therefore to work out Y here, I need to do that, take away from 180. So 180, take away 68, is going to be 112 degrees. I'm asked to give reasons for my answer, so I've used a couple of reasons there. The first one is that alternate angles are equal. And the second one is that it was 180 degrees on a straight line. In question 24, I'm given an equation, x cubed plus 10x equals 25, and I'm told it's got a solution between 1 and 2. And I'm asked to use try and improvement to find the solution. So as soon as I see that, I'm going to split my page up into three columns. The first column is the values I'm going to try for x. The second column is going to be my working. And the final column is going to be my common, where I'm going to compare it to the number 25. So I'm given a bit of a nudge and told to use 1 and 2 here. So I'm going to use 1 and 2. Okay, so I'll use my calculator, 1 cubed plus 10 lots of 1 is 11. And again, I would always show my working, so I'm going to 1 cubed plus 10 lots of 1 equals 11. Now, I've used brackets there. You could do the same. You could do 1 cubed plus 10 times by 1. You're still going to get the same answer. Okay, so then I'm going to use 2. So I'm going to do 2 cubed plus 10 lots of 2. And again, notice x here has changed, as has the x here. So that's 2, this is 2. 2 cubed is 8, plus 10 lots of 2 is 20, so that's going to be 28. That's going to be too large. The first one, sorry, was too small. And therefore, I know that my answer is somewhere in between 1 and 2. Now, this is 28. I've got 25 there, so it must be pretty close to the 2. So I'm going to try 2 points, sorry, 1.8. So I'm going to do 1.8 cubed plus 10 lots of 1.8. So again, 1.8 cubed plus 10 lots of 1.8. And that gets me 23.832. And I'm going to write down the full number. Now that is too small. So I'm going to try the number above it, which is 1.9. And that's going to be 1.9 cubed plus 10 lots of 1.9. So 1.9 cubed plus 10 lots of 1.9 gets me 25.859, which is too large. Now, you don't have to do this in as few goes as this. It can take as long as you want, as long as you get it down to these two numbers here that have got one decimal place. So my answer I need to one decimal place is one of these numbers. It is either 1.8 or 1.9. Now it's just a case of figuring out which one. So what I do to work that out is I'm going to draw a little number line and say that's 1.8, that's 1.9. This was too small, this was too large, so I need to know which one of these it's closer to. So I'm going to go bang in the middle at 1.85. And that should give me a clue. So I'm going to try 1.85. So 1.85 cubed plus 10 lots of 1.85. So on my calculator, working that out, 1.85 cubed plus 10 lots of 1.85. That is 24.831625. Okay. Now that number is too small which means that is still too small, which means my answer must be bigger than this. So my answer is somewhere in this bit here. And anywhere in this bit here is closer to 1.9. And therefore, I can get rid of that. My answer is 1.9. On question 25, I'm told there's some ribbons in a box and that they're either red, green, yellow, or white. And I'm showing the probabilities for three of them. And I'm asked to work out the probability that the ribbon chosen would be yellow. So 
So I'm going to take the three probabilities I've got, 0 0.15, 0 0.30, and 0 0.35, and I'm going to add them up, and I'm going to get that that comes to 0 0.80. Now, obviously, you can do this on your calculator. Now, I know that the probabilities for events like this that are exhaustive, which means it can only be one of the four, have to add up to one. So one take away 0 0.8 is going to be 0.2. So my probability is going to be 0.2 for yellow. Part B, I'm told there are 500 ribbons in the box, and I'm asked to work out the number of red ribbons. So the probability that it's red is 0 0.30. Now 0 0.30 is 30 out of 100, and therefore I need to know out of how many would be out of 500. Well, if it's 30 out of 100, I could actually do it by saying, OK, how many out of 500? And just by equivalent fractions, I can see that that would be multiplying by 5. If it's 35, 30 out of 100, it would be 30 times 5 out of 500, which would be 150 out of 500. So my answer is going to be 150. Um, there are other ways of doing this. You can take the probability of 0 0.30 and multiply it by the number of ribbons, 500. And if you do that on your calculator, 0 0.30 times by 500, you're going to get the same answer of 150. It's whichever one works best for you. On question 26, I'm shown an isosceles triangle. And these two sides are the ones that are the same. They're marked with a line. So I know those are the same length, and therefore these two angles here are the same size. And in part, I asked to explain why they're the same size. Um, and I'm going to say that base angles in an isosceles triangle are equal. Key word here is isosceles. Part B, I'm asked to solve the equation created by saying this is equal to that. So 3x minus 10 equals x plus 30. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and eliminate x from one side of this equation. So I'm going to take away x from this side and I'm going to take away x from this side. And if I do that, this here will disappear. What I've done is taken away the smallest amount of x. So 3x take x is 2x, I've still got to take away 10, and this is now gone, and I'm left with just positive 30, or 30, I don't have to write the positive in there. Right, similarly, I want um, just x on its own here, so I'm going to try and get rid of this. So I'm going to do the opposite of take away 10, which is add 10. And I'm going to add 10 to both sides. Adding 10 to this side gets me 2x, adding 10 to this side gets me 40. And I've got what 2x is, I need to know what 1x is, so I'm going to divide by 2 both sides. And that will get me what 1x is, so this would be x. And this divided by 2 would be 20. So x is 20. In question 27, I'm given a right angle triangle, and in part A I'm asked to work out its area. So I know that the area of a triangle is the base times by the height divided by 2. So the base in this case is 14 centimetres. The height is the 6 centimetres. Those two distances are at right angles. And I'm going to divide by 2. So the calculator, 14 times by 6 divided by 2 is 42. So the area of that triangle is 42 centimetres squared. In part B, I'm asked to calculate the length of AB. And I'm told to give my answer correct to two decimal places. Now, this is a right angle triangle, so I know that Pythagoras holds. And to do that, I need to identify that this is one of the shorter sides, this is the medium side, and this is the longer side. And then I can use my formula for Pythagoras, which is short one squared plus the medium one squared is equal to the long one squared. Well, the short one squared is going to be 6 squared, and the medium one squared is just 14 squared, and that should equal the long one squared, A to B, which I don't know. So 6 squared on my calculator will be 36. 14 squared is going to be 196. And again, if you're not sure, you can do that by typing 14 on the squared button and it equals. And that's still going to be the long one squared. So 36 at 196. I can do that again on my calculator if I need to. So 36. 36 add 196 is 232. And that's the long one squared. So to work out what the long one squared would be, I've done, I now need to square root both sides 
to get what the actual long side will be. So the square root of 232, and that will give me what L is. So L is 15.2315 And it's worth just checking here, is that the longest side in the triangle? Well, it's longer than 14 and 6, so at least it's in the right area. Now I'm asked to write my answer to two decimal places. So the second decimal place is this 3 here, the second number after the decimal point. Look at the one after it. That's less than halfway. It's four or less. So that means that uh, this number stays as it is. So my answer is going to be 15.23 centimetres. And that concludes the exam paper.